Noah Webster was said to be a devout Christian in his day. In 1828, he published his first dictionary. What is interesting about Webster's dictionary back then was that you could tell how much his Christian Bible beliefs influenced how he defined certain words. For instance, he defined marriage as the act of uniting a man and a woman for life in marriage until death separated them. He went on to say that marriage was instituted by God himself for the purpose of preventing the unrestrained or immoral intercourse of the sexes for promoting domestic happiness, contentment, blessedness, and joy, and also for securing the maintenance and education of children. Fast forward to today. And our modern dictionaries define marriage not only in the traditional way between a man and a woman, but also as the state of being united with a person of the same sex in a relationship. Furthermore, marriage can define today as common law, whereby two unmarried individuals live together so long that the government considers them married, not legally, but for the purpose of division of property in case they separate. So why is the defining of the word marriage so important? Because it, 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 is, it directly affects how society defines what constitutes a family. Due to the fact that God created the family, he alone has the divine right to judge it. Just because the government says you are a family does not mean that God agrees with you. God created the family, the first family, when he married Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And because he is our creator, and he's creator of heaven and earth and everything else in between, he alone gets to make all the rules and define what marriage is, and he defines what marriage is not. As well as he defines what a family is and what a family is not. However, the modern family today is broken because it lives by its own set of rules, not God's. The question for you today is this. Does your family live by what the Bible teaches or does your family live by the same standards as the sinful world around you? Today we begin a brand new series in light of everything that's going on in the United States and around the world. A series entitled Today's Issues in the Bible. We will address during this series some of the major issues that affect the church today. Amen. And we begin today simply with the sermon entitled Today, The Modern Family and the Bible. We're going to take a look at Genesis, primarily Genesis chapter 2 today. Next week we'll deal with chapter Three, and then the following Sunday, we'll deal with chapter four. So if you miss it, you're going to miss a major part of this series. Uh, this is just the foundation to get us started. Amen? Amen? So why not begin with the beginning of the Bible and begin with where the family started? It started in Scripture. Amen. Before I begin this series today, keep in mind that according to the Bible, God created three great institutions or entities to provide mankind. He created with structure on this earth. The first institution he created was the family. The second institution he created was government, and the third institution he created was the church. All three of these institutions were supposed to be led by the people of God. However, because the family is broken, so too is society, and every element of it is broken to include the government as well as the church. What makes these things worse for all of humanity is that the vast majority of families that exist today do not know God, nor do they seek to know him often because they have replaced God with some other form of man-made deity or religion, or they replaced them with their hobbies, or they replaced God with career advancement, educational achievement, jobs, family, or numerous other things placed above a personal relationship with God. As a result, the vast majority of families today are broken in the eyes of God and are not families that God can use. Never forget everything that God created, he did so, for a divine purpose. One of the best explanations in the Bible of this principle is Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18, when it talks about the incomparable Christ. In verse 13, it says, For he, when God the Father, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, who is Jesus the Christ, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
He, being Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, Christ, all things were created both in heavens, in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him, for him. Amen? In other words, everything in creation was created to glorify and honor God. If not, he would never have created it. He is before all things, him being Christ, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the church, the body of Christ, and he is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything, including first place in our lives. A little bit of background of chapter 2. Chapter 2 is a summary of chapter 1. However, chapter 2, focus, uh, the shift focuses from all the creation to the pinnacle of God's creation, which is mankind. In other words, chapter 1 of Genesis describes creation in broad terms, but in chapter 2, the author decides to zero in. Also, what sets the tone for chapter 2 of Genesis and beyond is Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 30. Everything else God spoke into existence. We know that from chapter 1. But when you get to chapter, verse 26 of chapter 1, then the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let us, it says. We were the only thing in creation that was created in the image and likeness of God. Amen. What that means is this word image comes from the Greek word iconia, which we get our English word icon, which means when, you, when you're working on a computer or a tablet and you have icons, what, when you touch it, what's behind it opens up. Amen. Amen. So if you touch Jesus, you can touch the Father. Amen. And you can't touch the Father unless you touch the Son. Amen. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. So if we were creating the image and likeness of God, what that simply means is you and I were created to reflect God's glory. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You and I are supposed to be like a mirror. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So when other people see us, they don't see us. They see Jesus. Yeah. If people looking at you and all they see is you, then I will submit to you. You might not even belong to Christ or you're not a good example of Christ. Yeah. Amen. He say amen and say ouch. And so our likeness, and let them rule. Let them rule over the creation, not over each other. Yeah. It was never intended for man to dominate man. Yeah. It was never intended for man to dominate women. It was never intended for women to dominate women. And it was never intended for women to dominate men. Amen. That is a direct result of the fall. Amen. So we still had the propensity to, to have dominion. The problem is sin has made all of that messed up. Amen. He said, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yields, yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which is as fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw that all that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Based on the Bible, the family was created by Jesus for Jesus. Also, marriage was created by Jesus for Jesus. Therefore, if you start a family, you have to obey God's rules from start to finish. Or be held accountable by God for defining or defiling something he created to be good for the purpose of worshiping and serving him. Also, if you get married without God's approval, meaning you marry someone that is not saved, 
or marry someone outside God's timing or marry someone that goes against God's biblical standard for marriage, such as same-sex relationships, you too, once again, will have to answer to God for why you did not take God seriously about what he had created. So you think that marriage is a human institution. Marriage wouldn't, wouldn't exist if God didn't create it. The family wouldn't exist if God didn't create it. Amen? And so here we are. We arrive in chapter 2. This is so powerful. I'm going to give you the points at the end. Because I want to walk you through chapter 2 to help you understand the significance of the family and how marriage is so important to God and how God intended for a man and a woman to unite and they would stay united until death do them part. Amen? And so chapter 2 verse 1 says, And so the heavens and the earth were completed and all their heavenly lights but the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested. Now, some people get this twisted. They say God created everything in seven days. That's not what it says. It said God created everything in six days. And then he rested on the seventh. Now, God didn't take a nap. So let me help you out with that one as well. When it said that God rested, it means that he had finished and he had ceased from his creative work. And when God stood back and looked at what he had done, God said, I'm going to bless that because that's very good. Amen. That's very good. When he created me and you, he stepped back and he said, that is good. The woman I created, that is good. The man that I created, that is good. But sin came in contaminated all of that. So we're no longer good in the eyes of God. Amen. So again, by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work he had done. It's a principle God is trying to teach us. What happens when you work seven days a week nonstop? You violate this principle. God didn't need rest, but if he took rest to set example for us, then it lets you know that you and I should not work all the time. There has to be a time that you take a part time that you say, I'm going to worship God. Amen? Because that's what that day of rest is supposed to be. That I focus on him, that I get my batteries recharged so that I can go back out and I can deal with an unfriendly uh, and, a, and a sinful world that I got to go interact with. Amen? What would happen if you just kept passing up every gas station as your car gets closer and closer and closer to eat? You will be walking because that car won't be moving. And some Christians ain't moving because guess what? They keep passing up the service station. The service station is the house of God. Amen. They seem to go everywhere else, but they can't seem to make it to the filling station. Which gives you the spiritual charge that you need to make it through this world and this maze called life. Amen. Because what God does when you come to worship him, because we were designed to worship him, amen? Everything that ails us is designed to be fixed by worship. Because what worship does, it takes our focus off our problems and it puts our focus on him. Amen? So if you, if, if you keep your focus on God, you don't have to walk around, worry about walking around looking like you've been sucking on lemons. Amen. When you keep your focus on God, you don't have to worry about all mad and agitated all the time. When you keep your focus on God, when you just, your face just get that radiation spiritually from God, you can't help but smile. You can't help but glow. You can't help but smile and somebody looking at you like, what's wrong with you? Then you know that somebody just hit your car. Praise be to God because God will fix that or he'll provide me another one. Because you begin to look at life in a different way. See, some of y'all walk around mad all the time, angry all the time. Then you get home and your wife ain't done nothing to you and you're mad at her too. Now what she ought to do is take that food that she just made you and just put in the trash. She said, I'm going to give you something to be mad about. Amen. 
Because you cannot take what happens to you out in the world, take it back home and dump it on your family. And expect your family to respond in a loving manner. It don't work that way. Because didn't you say you was a Christian? And Christians don't behave like that, according to Scripture. Now, if you want to call yourself a Christian and you want to behave like that, then you got a different definition of what Christian means. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Amen? Verse 3 said, then God blessed the seventh day. He didn't just bless it, he sanctified it. He made it holy. This is how you end up with the Sabbath. This is how you end up with God giving the Jews the Sabbath as a Sabbath day of rest. Amen? Where they can take their focus of working and put their focus on him. To get their batteries recharged in his presence. Amen. He says, because on it that day he rested from all his work which he, God had created. Do you know in eternity past everything that exists God created back then? Did you know that? Everything that God created was created back then. And it was only in God's timing when he needed to come forth, God speaks and it happens. God is the only one who can speak and stuff happen. If God don't have it, he just say, come forth. It shows up. That's how powerful and how awesome God is. Amen. He's the only one who has that power and authority. Amen. Now, you get to verse 4. Now he's finna shift gears. He said all that to say this. He, now he's going to give us an account of creation that involves me and you. Watch this. He said, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In that day, the Lord God made the earth and heaven. Up until this time, God had only revealed himself as Elohim. Burashi bara Elohim hashamayayim. In the beginning, for y'all think I'm speaking tongues, it's actually Hebrew. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's what that says in Hebrew. The first name that God reveals himself in scripture to us is Elohim. It's a plural name of him. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It is God's creative name. But here he reveals his personal name. And his personal name is Yahweh, which we often translate as Jehovah. All right? Here's the significance. If you go to your death, and you only know God as Elohim, you're going to hell. In order for you to go to heaven, you got to know him personally by his covenant name, which is Yahweh or Jehovah. Amen. But here he puts them together. He calls himself the Lord Yahweh God Elohim. Amen. Made earth and heaven. Note with the introduction of name Yahweh with God, which is God and Elohim, in these verses, God introduces relationally to his creation. Elohim is God's creative name. Yahweh, Jehovah, is his covenant name. He said, now, verse 5, now no shrub of the field was yet on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet been sprouted. For the Lord God had not, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. All right? So far, no rain. All right? You know it didn't rain to Noah. So how did God water the earth? The scripture tells us God watered it from the midst of the ground. All right? So when Noah's out there building the boat and he say, hey, which God gave him 120 years to build it because it gave people 120 years to repent, which they didn't. And Noah's out there building his boat and, and people walking by and say, what are you doing, Noah? Oh, I'm building a boat. What you going to do with that, Noah? Oh, it's going to rain. Rain? What's rain? Oh, it's going to flood. Well, what's floods? Well, God's going to come wipe everything out. Oh, really? You crazy. I'm going back to my business. And Noah kept on building a boat. And then God sent all that rain. Amen. You know the story. Keep reading Genesis. He says that, but a mist, verse 6, but a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Verse 7, then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living person or a living soul. Think about that for a second. 
God scooped up dirt. And God formed it and he shaped it and he molded it and what, what he wanted to be and look like. And that up until that time, the human being had no life until God, the Hebrew word is ruha, which translates breath, wind, or spirit. And it says that God blew his breath into man and man became a living being. Think about that for a second. The power that God has. Something that did not exist. See, when you and I create something, we really don't create anything. We take pre-existent materials and create stuff. God starts and creates something out of nothing. He's the only one who had that capacity. He's the only one who has that ability. The closeness that God had when we became a living soul, with God just breathing the breath of of life into us and we came alive. Amen. Verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. There he placed the man whom he had formed. So God formed and he had fashioned. Now we gather from what I read to you. It said, then God said, then it says, then God said, verse 3, verse 5, verse 7, verse 11, verse 14, verse 26. Then verse 30 said, then God saw. Well, what did he see? He saw what he said. Amen. Some of y'all get that on the way home. He saw what he said. He spoke, and these things happened. But you got to understand, we're the pinnacle of God's creation. Amen. Not the angels, not the animal kingdom, not the physical earth. It's me and you. Because we're the only thing that God created like he created me and you. And we're the only thing that God created in his image and his likeness. How valuable we are to God. Amen. How valuable we are to God. What makes us not valuable to God is we don't act like what he created us to be. Amen. Now, in theory, we're still valuable because he went to Calvary because of us. Amen. But if you want to be a useful tool for God, the only way that happens is you have to keep your life in God's hands. Amen. So out of the ground, the Lord God calls every tree to grow that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil was also there. Right. So don't get it twisted. Man was a vegetarian at this time. There was no animals killed at this time. Man is a vegetarian, okay? And God put all of these trees in the garden. Man had multitudes of sources to eat from. You understand something? He didn't just put one tree there that he, that he was limited. When you read the story, you got to understand that he had a multitude of resources. So you can only imagine in the garden because it was perfect when Adam picked from that tree. Oh, it didn't take too long for it to grow back. So what I'm trying to tell you, God always gave him a supply that was plentiful. Wow. Amen. Amen. So he fixed the garden so much so that it was self-sustaining. But he needed someone to cultivate and to keep it. See, God doesn't need a material world because he's God. Amen. He has no needs. But he, everything he put here was put here for you and I so that we can have everything we need so we can honor and glorify him. Are you getting this? Amen. Amen. God don't waste anything. You might ask yourself, why does some of the things God create, he should have just kept them to himself. <laughs> These snakes and all this kind of stuff, yeah. bugs, you know, flies, gnats, he could have kept them. You know, he, we could have we done without them. But you got to understand something. That everything that has breath, praise ye the Lord. We might not understand it. We might not get it. If God created birds, birds praise God in a bird kind of way. Amen. God created dogs, so dogs praise God in a dog kind of way. Amen. A horse praises God in a horse kind of way. Y'all get it, right? Amen. So when you say amen, 
You know, the donkey might say, hee haw. <laughs> but let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. That's what you got to understand about creation. But see, the creation is out of order because of sin. The chaos of sin has disrupted the whole world order. There were no storms in the garden, no hurricanes, no earthquakes, no sickness or disease was in the garden. What you got to understand is how powerful sin is. Remember, I told you in our last series that I did, sin would do always do three things to you, take you from you willing to go, keep you alone, will be kept, cost you more you willing to pay. And the only way you can get around that is God has to come in and break the chain. He has to break the cycle of sin in your life. Unless you have a personal relationship with Jesus, he cannot and will not break the cycle of sin in your life. Amen? So God put these two trees in the garden. One was intended for us to have access to for all of eternity. Because one of these trees still shows up in Revelations. Amen? And that's the tree of life. Because God had already intended us to have eternal life. Amen. The other was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15 said, then Lord God took the man and put him in the garden and to cultivate it and to tend to it. All right. That means God put Adam in the most spectacular paradise the world has seen. But God put Adam there to, to do work. In other words, to tend it and keep it. However, when there was no sin, when Adam worked, the ground always responded to him. Are you getting this? Adam didn't have to sweat the way we do. He worked, but it wasn't as hard as for us. Sin came in, changed all of that. Amen. That's why if you live in sin, the harder it gets. Amen. It keeps on getting harder. Work is something good for man. It was part of Adam's perfect existence before the fall. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. God didn't create man to be lazy. God didn't create man to be a bum. God didn't create man to look like what he looks like today. He didn't create him to be selfish. He didn't create him to, to dominate women that way, the way he does. He didn't create him to just strive to, for, for power and politics and all the things that man does today. God never created man for that. But sin has caused all of that. Amen. And so of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, you shall not eat the presence of this tree. The presence of choice for Adam was good because for Adam to be created, uh, be a creature of free will, there had to be a choice, some opportunity to rebel against God. If there is never a command or never something forbidden, there can never be choice. God wants our love and obedience to him uh, to be the love out of love and obedience because it's the choice we make. God will never, ever make us love him. He won't. It has to be your free will, your free choice. Because if he makes you, that's not genuine. Amen. What happens is a man makes a woman marry him by gun, by force, by threats. And this happens, by the way. That's not genuine. She's never going to reciprocate any love toward him out of fear. God doesn't do that, so why do we do it to each other? Amen. Amen? The Lord God commanded the man, verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree, from any tree of the garden, you may freely eat. The Lord God commanded the man, uh, remember, Eve had, had her grand interest yet. Because when she came, she made a grand interest. You ought to know that, did you? Because God had something else to give Adam. What was that? His word. Because God commanded. The Lord commanded the man and expected him to obey. However, many men today hate to, the idea of others telling them what to do. That kind of independence makes someone feel like a man. But God measures manhood by a man's ability to submit to the rule of God. God don't measure ability by how tough you are, how smart you are, how much you can earn, your earning potential, or what's in your 401K, what's in your bank stocks and all that. That's not how God measures a man. 
You can have a thousand children, but God never say you're a man. You have male persuasion. But to God, you're not a man. Because you're only a man when that man is in the hand of God. That's what makes a man. Amen. And a woman is not a woman. She can birth as many children as she wants. But in God's eyes, you're not a woman until you submit to the will of God. Amen. So the question is this. It's often asked, why would God put a tree there and then forbid Adam not to eat from it? Here's the key. God wanted Adam to obey, but God gave Adam the freedom of choice, the freedom to choose. Without choice, Adam would have been like, more like a prisoner forced to obey. Therefore, Adam's obedience would not have to be, uh, been his. It would have been hollow. The trees provide an exercise in choice with rewards for obeying and bad consequences for disobeying. Here's how Paul says it. Galatians 6, 7 said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Word of a man sows, he also reaps. So you thought Paul made that up. No, Paul got that from scripture because that's what Jesus was trying to tell us in the garden. Amen. From any tree of the garden, you may freely eat. This is God given freedom given to Adam was a divinely ordained right, not a human determined one. Biblical freedom is the responsibility and the opportunity to choose max to maximize one's calling under God through God's influence. God gave Adam a tremendous amount of freedom, allowing him to enjoy whatever God provided. Did y'all get that? God gave us an enormous amount of freedom. And that goal is so we can enjoy what he blesses us with and gives us that we have uh, able to control. It's called stewardship. It's a stewardship of time. It's a stewardship of uh, talent and stewardship of treasure. But biblical freedom, as opposed to our cultural ideas of freedom, has healthy limits. The fundamental issue at work in this passage is is would man live by divine revelation or human reasoning? That's the choice you have. Do you live by divine instruction or do you live by whatever your brain tells you or whatever somebody else's brain tells you? Those are the choices you have because that's the only two ways you can live. Your source of information either comes from God. If it comes to human reason, it's going to be influenced by Satan. Therefore, your source of information is either come from God or from Satan. And the how you live will determine and show people which one of those you get influenced by. Amen. Amen. Verse 17 says, but from the, the tree of knowledge, good and evil, you should not eat for the day that you eat from it. You should certainly die. That's absolute certainty. God not only made his command clear to Adam, but he also clearly explained the consequences for disobedience. God says, you will surely die. Death always means separation. Always. Nothing dies and there's not separation. Amen. When you die, your soul, your spirit, who you really are, separates from this human flesh. Amen. And if you're a believer, you know Jesus. The Bible says absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You don't know Jesus, then you're going to know hellfire real fast. Amen. You should surely die. This refers to the certainty of death, not immediate death. Because remember, they didn't die immediately. And we'll deal with that next week. But what happened was as soon as they did, they were spiritually separated from God. That's the fall of humanity. And all of us, because we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, we're all born fallen. We're all born in need of a Savior, and there's only one Savior, and that's Jesus Christ. You cannot find God through religion. You cannot find God through good works. You cannot find God through human reasoning, as many have tried. You can only find him through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 18 said, then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was his name. Think about that. We call things the way we call them today is because Adam called them that. So it lets you know that God didn't start the human race with a dummy. This was a very intelligent man. Adam was 
very, very intelligent, very high IQ. Because remember, he's not tainted with sin. Not at this point. Amen. Verse 20 said, and the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the sky and to every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help or suitable for him. Did you get what just happened? It said, not, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so God gives Adam all the animal kingdom. But here's the thing God noticed. He is still alone. So when you say your dog is your, is your best friend and not your wife, that's a tough one. Your wife ought to make you go live in the doghouse with the dog then. And, and, and when you want some food, you should ask the dog for some of his treats. Because that's your best friend. Amen. That's a slap into women's face for a dog to ever be called man's best friend. Because it should be your wife. Your wife should be your best friend. Amen. So he says, so the Lord God calls. After he said there was no help or found suitable for him. Here come the grand entrance of woman. Adam ain't never seen nothing like this before. He's he, he been seeing all the skunks and the, and, the, and the dogs and the horses and the cows and the fleas and the bugs and the buzzards. He's seen all of that. But watch this. God calls a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up his flesh at that place. Now, everything else, the animal kingdom, Adam himself, was formed from the dust of the ground. Uniquely, God made the woman from the rib of Adam. What's the significance? Unity. Because God was performing the first marriage. Amen? Everything else came from the dust of the ground, but she came directly from Adam because the Hebrew word for man is ish, and the word it uses in the same text for woman is isha. Amen. That's how close they were supposed to be. Because as long as Adam and Eve walked around that garden, God spoke to them by one name. She didn't get on personal name until they were getting ready to get kicked out the garden. Watch and pay attention to the text. We'll deal with that next week. But I just want to throw that out there for you. Because you need to start reading the Bible and stop glossing over it. Amen. And some, people, some women would say, man, my husband still sleep to this day. He still sleeps to this day. Verse 22, and the Lord God fashioned. Now, 11 times in this text, it says the Lord God, Elohim. I mean, Yahweh Elohim, because he used Lord first. Lord God fashioned. Now, get this. Women going to love this. When it said he created man, he just formed him. But when he created women, he fashioned her. Are you getting it? It's almost like he rushed to create me and you. And then when he took women, he created woman. I'm going to take my time with this one. I'm going to take my time with this one. Because when he wakes up and sees her, he's going to say, oh, mama. He, he going to know she don't look like him. Amen. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. This was a wedding. Amen. This is a wedding. And it says, the man said, oh, mama. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> the man said, Lord Jesus, there is a God in heaven. No. He said, at last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh shall, shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The language used to describe the first man and the woman in these verses indicates that they were human and needed all things necessary to sustain human life. Due to their environment, which is Eden, Adam and Eve enjoyed perpetual but contingent immorality by being able to eat from the tree of life and not sinning against God's command. All this ended with the fall in chapter 3. Verse 24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. 
and join together, which is said leave, and some translate, use the word cleave, and they shall become one flesh. That's the uniqueness of marriage. This is the first family. See, as long as Adam was by himself, he was not designated as a family. He was just an individual. But because God had something else in mind instead of individuals walking around this earth, God intended there be a purpose for the family. So guess what? He created a family. And he saw that man was, he needed someone that on his intellect, he needed someone that he could communicate with, that he can't communicate with a dog like that. So when a man is talking to a dog, that's why a dog looks at him and says, hmm? Hmm? Oh, y'all getting this? Because the goal was that they be so close, united together, they operate as one unit, even though they're two individuals. Amen. Amen. Oh, y'all getting this? For again, for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother. Now, here's what you got to understand about Jewish culture. When a man got married in Jewish culture, he didn't leave his mother and father that way. You know what the father would do? He would actually build a house onto an extension of the main house so that his son and his bride would, uh, would come and live. Now, he has his own sleeping quarters and all of that, but he has access to the main house. Do you know that's the principle behind what Jesus is talking about in heaven? See, y'all thought y'all were going to have your own mansion. Living on Gold Street off Hollywood, Hollywood Boulevard. Y'all thought that's how it was going to be. It's a description of heaven. It's, 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 it's a picture. It's metaphoric language is what it's using. Amen? But here, what he's trying to explain to us, how central the family is to God and how important marriage is because marriage was the glue that started the family. The problem is, is we start the family without the glue. Well, what's the glue? The Holy Spirit is the glue. So if you start a family without God in, in, involved in it, your family starts with no glue. It doesn't, it doesn't start with what able to hold it together. Because, because both of us, the husband and wife are sinners, they're going to do things that's going to offend each other at some point in their marriage. But what keeps them together is because of the fact the Holy Spirit guides them and leads them. Amen. Because when the Holy Spirit is not guiding you or leading you, then your marriage is, sub is subjected to all the failures and difficulties that the rest of life is able to throw at it. Amen. Because your mind and your eyes will not be on Jesus. You're going to be mad at every little thing that she does. And you, she's going to be mad at every little thing you do. And when Satan gets in your business, it's going to be hard to get him out. That's why you get into arguments and, and, and Satan is saying, I was you, I'll call him this. Oh, blockhead. If I was you, I'd call her this. Oh, you can't cook, burn up the food all the time. And so now you're throwing spears. And when that escalates, guess what? You begin to say things you can't take back. Because it's one thing when you're driving along and you're in traffic and somebody shoots you the bird, you know, the finger. You get mad about that, right? But when your own wife do that to you. Oh, yeah. When your husband call your names, that's not fit for a woman to be called. Guess what? You can say I'm sorry a million times. It will not erase what she heard. That's why you ought not say things. You have no business saying things. Because if you really appreciate the woman God gave you, then you're going to lift her up and build her up with your words and not tear her down with your words. Because everything you say ugly to her, then you say telling God, I don't appreciate her. I'm just trying to help somebody today. Because the problem is, when that happens, and that division start happening, that's why someone can be married for 30 years and get a divorce. Because something happened in year one, two, or three, or four, and it was never fixed. It was never dealt with. And all of these things just added up until we looked at each other and said, I don't even love you anymore. I can't even stand you. 
See, it used to be what people years ago, back in the 50s and 60s, they stayed together no matter what. They were just roommates. But people today don't want to be nobody's roommate. They are divorced in a minute. They were divorced in a heartbeat today. And, and the state and government will make it easy for you because they have no fault in divorce. You can actually sign the divorce and don't admit you did anything wrong. You just say, hey, I, it's irre- judge is irreconcilable, whatever that means. And I've never used that word before I came to court, but she is that. And a judge will sign it. Oh, but you thought that things would get better because the grass was green on the other side. Which is why you take that same brokenness that you got into a new relationship. Because you never healed. You never restored. But you just jumped back into another relationship because you didn't want to be alone. That's the problem with humanity. That's the problem with fallen humanity. Amen. Because if God is going to bless your life so he can use it and he can use your marriage for his glory, then it's something he requires of me and you. Notice that Adam was created to be the federal head of the human race. Therefore, when God created the family, he was created to be the spiritual head of the family. All right. Let me tell you what that is and then let me tell you what it's not. What it is, is that the man was designed by God to lead his family in worship. Amen. So when the fam- when a man of God knows in order for the family to grow, it's the husband who's going to be leading the family to go to church. It's the husband who's going to lead his family in devotionals and prayer in the home. It's going to be the husband who does that. But here's we turn that on his head because the husband acts today as though I'm not only the boss of these kids, I'm the boss of her. And that's what causes all the problems. Because you got to understand something, man, you ain't the boss of anybody. You're the boss of those kids in a biblical way, but you're not the boss of her. She's not the boss of you either. Because what's supposed to happen is that both of you are supposed to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is supposed to be the boss of both of you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let me close and now I'll give you the points. So now that I have explained all of that, and I'm going to do a deeper dive come Wednesday, you need to come and hear it. What is, what is God's divine purpose of creating the family? No, without marriage, there would not be a family. The first thing God created the family to be is to be the building, spiritual building block of society. What that means is the family would be God's foundation for everything else he would build in society. However, the first foundation is Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, and everything else is built on top of that. What I'm trying to tell you, if your family is built and, and Jesus Christ is not the foundation, then you don't have a family that God can use and your family is susceptible to crumbling at any time. Amen? The second thing we learn from this text is, is the purpose for God creating a family is to be the biblical union for a God-ordained, God-ordained marriage between a man and a woman to be united as one flesh for the purpose of glorifying God. God didn't put you together just because y'all might look good together. He didn't put y'all together just so y'all can earn a lot of money together and, and put your, and be what we call today a power couple. <laughs> That's not the primary reason he put together. He put you together, if he actually is the one put you together, by the way, to honor and glorify him. If you're not honoring and glorifying him in your marriage, then guess what? You're not a family God can use. So why would God keep blessing you when you are using what he gives you in order to offend him and not to glorify him? Amen. God ordained means God created and God approved. Also, the significance is Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. God never ordained that. Amen. God has never ordained for two men to be in a relationship that way. God never ordained two women to be in a relationship that way. Amen. God never ordained it. That is the direct result of the fall. Amen. We're going to break that down a little bit more on Wednesday night. The third point we get from this text is to be a biblical, the family is to be the biblical framework for which a God-ordained husband 
and a wife or to raise a God-ordained husband, a God-ordained wife, or to raise and nurture children for the glory of God. Our children are all jacked up today because we, they don't see Christ in our home. The reason why men carry, young men carry on the way they do because they don't have a father that walks with God that's teaching them how to, what a God's supposed to look like. You know what it's supposed to look like? You know what your sons are supposed to learn how to be godly men? Watching the godly dad interact with, her, with the godly mom. Daughters are supposed to see their mothers and how they interact with the father so they can learn how to be godly wives. Amen. But what are they seeing today? Because most of the families are fractured. Most families are raised by a single mother. And I know we say, we, we use biblical incorrect terms. We say that my mother was my mother and my father. Well, that's biblically incorrect and biblical impossibility. We understand what they mean because she had to be the breadwinner. and she had to do all these other things. But when you find yourself as single, what you do is stay in your lane and let Jesus Christ come alongside you. And fill that void the moment you straddle the fence and try to do both jobs that you is biblically impossible for you to do. It was never intended for men uh, to be women. It was never intended for women to be men. Amen. And in that sense, what we understand is the fact that we follow what the scripture says. Because if God puts this out there at the very beginning, that means first things first is important. Because the family was the center of everything God wanted to do on this earth. If you haven't caught that by now. Amen. So again, it's to be the biblical framework. The family for which God ordained husbands and a God ordained wife are to raise and nurture children for the glory of God. In other words, when when the children see you and how you and the wife interact, they learn what true love is really about. All that time you spend arguing, cussing, fussing, complaining in front of them, they walk outside. Whoa, it's me, my family, all jacked up. And then you wonder why their behavior is all jacked up. Because they're learning it from you. When little boys go to school and call little girls B words and H words, guess where they learned it? They learn this stuff from you. If you don't want to pour that into your kids, then stop doing it in front of your kids. Amen. And even if your kids are grown, stop doing that in front of your kids. Because sometimes grown kids are some of the worst kids. Grown kids can be worse than little kids. There's nothing worse than a 30-year-old baby that never grew up because you coddled them to death all the time. Let me help y'all out, man. When you cut off the knees of your spouse because your spouse is trying to discipline your son or daughter, and guess what? You step in and you like act like everything is fine. And the problem you're going to have is, guess what? You just undermined her authority. You just made her voice useless. Because y'all don't talk together. You don't make those decisions in front of those kids like that. You make those decisions yourself in private. So when you got a discipline to make decisions in front of them, that decision already made. So when one parent say, no, we're not doing that. They don't run to the other parent and say, hey, can I get a second opinion? Because the moment you overrule the other parent and y'all ain't talked about it, then you just gave your kid the authority. And boy, kids are smooth. Boy, they will play the ends against the middle. And some of y'all, they walk in their room with, with a chest cast smile knowing they just got over. Because you didn't stand up. Because y'all didn't understand something. That's the home that God blessed you, husband, and you, wife. Your kids are only on loan in that home until they're 18, 19. About, about a good age where you say, y'all got to go. Now, they're still there at 35, 40 years old, and you never enforce no rules. And that don't mean they can't move back in at some point, help out or something. But some of them, they 40 years old, ain't never left. Why should they pay a mortgage when you paying it? Why should they buy a car when you just hand me down? You just give them one of yours. Why should they have to buy food? You feed them everything. You just got grown toddlers living in your house. That's what you got. Amen. The 
fourth thing is the family was to be the biblical model for the church. The biblical model for the church. When God created the family, he was looking way down the road when he created the church. Because the husband is supposed to be the spiritual head at home. So tell me something. How does that flip when you get to the church? How does the woman take over the church? When the church is be the spiritual model? People hate when pastors say that, but it's the biblical model. It's the biblical model. Amen. So in closing, I want to say this to you. I know that we went a little bit longer today. Some of the top reasons why one in two marriages fail today, even in the church, is because of the following. This is not exhaustive, by the way. This is not in any, any order except the last one. Number one, failure to understand the role of, of a husband and the role of a wife in marriage. The way that you get your information of what the instructions are, they're found in the Bible. If you're living your marriage out in a way that does not fit by the Bible, you need to stop doing it and learn, read the Bible and learn what it says and live that way. The second thing is poor communication. They can't talk. They talk past the other, talk over each other. Or they use profane language when they talk to each other. The third thing is financial problems. The financial problems has drowned out any joy, any hope, Especially when you got a lazy husband, don't want to work. I don't know how many counseling situations I've had where the man just don't want to work. It's not that he can't work, he don't want to. And the wife is out there working two jobs. Say it ain't so. Number four, negative outside influences such as family and friends. You got to be careful. That's why when he says when a man gets married, he leaves and he cleaves. In other words, when a man gets married, then his mother and father is no longer his immediate responsibility. It becomes his wife. It becomes his children. Amen? But the problem is you've got so many meddling in-laws. It's all up in your business. And you allow it. Because they dictate your home. They tell you what kind of furniture to buy. They tell you everything then they run in their house and yours. Amen? Oh, you got the meddling friends. Always in your business. Girl, if I was you, girl, stop giving me advice because your, your marriage tore up. It ain't a long time ago, so how you going to give me advice? And sometimes you guys need to let people know in a very polite Christian way, thank you, but I'm not listening to your advice no more. I don't even want to hear it. The fifth thing is having children and not ready for them, whether financially, emotionally, physically, or spiritually. You know how many families have been destroyed? Because they have kids and nobody has learned how to parent. Or one parent is doing all the work by themselves. That will wreck relationships. There's no, because it's going to wreck intimacy and it's going to cause, off the time it causes men to resent their own kids. Because he wants her to sit in his lap, but he can't because the child already always in her lap. What am I trying to tell you? What I'm trying to tell you, you got to remember what brought you together. All right? This is why it's important, even if your kids are small, this is why you have to have Christian people around you that you're able to befriend that you can trust your kids with. Because you're going to need date night again. Amen? Because you can't wait 20 years to tell them kids out of the house and then go on a date 20 years later. Because all the romance is gone, all the fun is gone, all the joy is gone, and then he's gone. Amen. Just trying to make it plain. The sixth reason, having different priorities as well as different beliefs about life. All the time, sometimes there's political uh, disagreements. And the hallmark of all of this is the seventh point. A lack of foundation is Jesus Christ the saving Lord. Either one of them or neither of them know Jesus or lives for Jesus. None of them. Oftentimes, it's not a priority to go to church. I don't know how many conversations I have with neighbors and friends, and they say, boy, we need to find a church. But they're not really serious. One's waiting and waiting on the other. 
And you can't blame the pandemic because y'all was acting like that before the pandemic. Amen. So is there ever a time, if there was ever a time that you and I need Jesus is now. Because your family, if it's that important to you, I don't care how much you messed up. I don't care how many mistakes you made. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sin. It's not talking about the kind of love you and I do. It's talking about agape love. The kind of love that God shows toward us. So at some point, men, you got to step up and put your big boy pants on. And you're going to have to stop acting like a man. Not like the world kind of man, but acting like the godly kind of man. Because every day of your life should be letting that wife you have know, baby, just like we first got together, you're still the apple of my eye. You're still the peach in my cobbler. You're still all of that to me. Amen. Because the moment you stop talking to her in a way that she wants to hear from you, if she don't hear from you, she'll listen to a man. Somebody else tell her. And that's when those extramarital affairs start. Because nobody should out compliment your wife but you. And nobody should out compliment your husband but you. Because every day, the things you do, the small things as well as the big things, they should know how you feel. Because you tell them, you remind them, you do those things, those little things and those big things that you let them know how much I appreciate you. Because the moment one of you all feels that, hey, they don't love me no more, guess what? They might not go anywhere, but I, I promise you they won't respond the same. They will not respond the same. Because something is broken. And you help break it. But you don't want to help fix it. Because you already decided I'm mad. And I'm just going to stay mad. And if we get a divorce, I don't care. And when you use that kind of language, then you're not looking at God. Because God would never have you use that language. Amen? And you have to decide that what kind of family we're going to have. Men have to decide I'm going to stay in my lane. Women have to decide I'm going to stay in my lane. Kids have to decide we're going to stay in our lane. So the family can be made whole and be nurtured in Christ. Amen? Because you don't want to just go to the gas station every now and then because you're going to be pushing your car. That's why you don't want to go to the spiritual gas station every now and then. Because you're going to be pushing something else. But it's when you have decided these are our priorities as a family and we're going to not allow anything else to come between that. God first. Because God is first, that means that church is going to be up there. Bible study is going to be up there. Prayer is going to be up there. Amen? And I'm not going to allow anything to get in the way that breaks that cycle so God can stop blessing me and using me. Amen? Because you want your kids to have peace in their home. They get enough chaos at school. They get enough chaos when they go outside the door. But you want to, when people walk into your house, you want them to feel the presence of God. If you kick them out and you let other things rule, there won't be no peace in your house. The devil will rule in your house. Your anger and your bitterness are going to rule in your house. This is why we have the problems and issues we have today. Because we're just not serious about Jesus. And when we start being serious about him, guess what? Then he is able to hold all things together. But we have to remain in his hands. We have to decide, husbands, wives, and children, that we're going to feel God's plan and purpose for us and that we're going to do his will. I hope that speaks to you today. I hope that helps you today. Because you, you don't have to have a marriage like the rest of the world. You don't have to have a marriage like your family or some families we grew up in and around. You can actually have a marriage that has peace and joy and hope. And that God is blessing you beyond measure so that he can use your life to be a blessing to others. So that you be a good steward of what he gives you. Amen. 
So stop letting other things come between you and your family. Allow Jesus Christ to be first. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand of praise. Let us pray together. Eternal God, our Father, we bow before you. Lord, in many ways, this was a tough message. But it landed right where you needed to land. Because there, perhaps there's men, there are women who are listening today, children that are listening today, that this speaks to them. I challenge men today. And maybe you're here and you have not been the man in your family like you're supposed to be. You dropped the ball. I want you to stand and say, Lord, I've heard you. I've not been leading my family to worship. I have not been leading my family the right way. I've allowed my job and everything else to get in the way. This is your opportunity to say, Lord, I'm here. I heard you. From this day forward, I'm going to be a new man. That's your opportunity. You're not saying anything, just you stand. And say, Lord, I'm going to do better. Lord, I heard you. I'm being a better example for my home. Lord, I heard you. I've allowed my job to get in the way. I've allowed my hobbies to get in the way. I've allowed all these other things to get in the way. And when I examine my life, oh God, I know that I'm not being what you have me to be. This is your opportunity. For our women that are here today, that may speak to you. Maybe I've not been the woman I need to be. Maybe I'm not, whether I'm single or married, I'm still struggling. I'm still not where God needs me to be. This is your opportunity to stand. This is your opportunity to say, God, I heard you. I want to be the woman of God you created me to be. For our children that are here, if that speaks to you, I've not followed my family. I've not followed my mother and father. I've given them a hard time. And I have not been obedient in my home like I should. That's your opportunity to stand and say, Lord, today I'm going to do better. With the power of your Holy Spirit, empower me. Help me to do better. Not just know better. If that speaks to you in any way, you can pray this prayer me. Say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I heard you. Lord, today, I want to be the person of God you created me to be. If I'm a husband, I want to be the husband of God. If I'm a wife, I want to be the wife of God. If I'm single, I still want to be a single person to be useful for your kingdom, oh God. If I'm a child, a youth today, I want to be what you have created me to be. Lord, today, I've fallen short and I've missed the mark. I accept Jesus as my Savior. I ask you to forgive me all my sins. And even if I prayed this before, today, oh God, I pray to reconnect and recommit to you. Fill me with the presence of your Holy Spirit afresh and anew. Empower me, oh God, to walk right, to talk right, to act right, to live right and do right. Help me to be the reflection of your glory. It's my prayer. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said amen. 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 Let's just make this commitment. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. might want to get you a plaque that has that verse on there. Joshua 24. Because that should be the testimony of everybody, every family here. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And having that constant reminder hanging in your house or creating your own with this 
printing out that scripture and putting it on the refrigerator. That everybody in the house is reminded this is our purpose is to be a family that God can use. Because we will serve the Lord. Amen. We will all do our part in serving the Lord. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord an unhappy praise. It's good to see each and every one of you to our guests today. Uh, in the family of faith, we welcome you. And thank you for worshiping with us. Those who tune in online today, uh, we thank God for each of you. And so I just want to encourage you that you would come on Wednesday where we do a, a deeper dive. We have interaction and discussion about this passage and others that link to this passage. And so that we continue to grow and do those things. Upon the benediction, uh, there's an announcement that uh, they want to give. Uh, they're going to have a meeting uh, with youth about the youth ministry and the youth event that's coming up in August. Uh, and so well, you'll hear more about that. So you keep your seat. Receive your benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you, give you his peace that nothing you face in life or anything you or God cannot handle. May you go forth today in the power and love of Almighty God that you will be a family that God can use, that God will bless your marriage. He will bless your children. He will bless your wealth. He will bless your health and strength. And he will give you everything you're lacking that you need to do his will. May he give you the strength to handle what he's walking you through. And may he bless you forevermore as our prayer. And may God watch between me and you as our prayer until we meet again. And all of God's people said amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. Very quickly, um, we just like to um, intimate us and let us know what the church is 